So thank you for coming. My name is Gail Suzanne, and I moved to Lakeville about a year and a couple of months ago. And I published my first book in 2013, and I self-published it. Um, the reason that I wrote a book to begin with, I was in my hmm, late 40s, and my mother died suddenly in a car accident. It was just, boom, today she's here, and 10 minutes later, she's not. And I had gone through a very tumultuous relationship with her. And I had learned a lot during my, my younger years. And I had been through a lot of abuse, a lot of um, bullying, just bad relationship with my mom. My parents divorced when I was young, so I had a lot of heartache and a lot of pain. And I met my Prince Charming when in college. It was wonderful. And then a few years after we had our daughter, he said, I want my girlfriend to be in our marriage too. <laughs> so <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like, what are you on planet Mars? And we're, we're very good now, which is great. But I left the marriage, we, we split. I had a four-year-old. And at that time, everything in my world just came crumbling down. And I, had, I was about 37 at the time, and I had to relearn how to live my life. I was always depressed. I was always gloom and doom. I had no hope for a, a wonderful life. And it was really difficult. So I really dug deep, went to counseling, did, you know, relied on friends, tried to make myself healthy in my mind, body, spirit. Hi there, director. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> Come on in. Hi. So I'm just giving a little background here. So, okay. So I decided to do a lot of self self uh, reflection and a lot of work on myself. And when my mother died, it was very interesting because I was like, "Wow, life is really short. It's really short, and you just never know." And in the time between. Um, my divorce, and when my mother died, I had married again. I had raised a step family, and my life turned around. I was like, wow, a lot of that inner stuff that I worked on really made a change in my life, and I was really happy and really grateful. So once my mother died, I decided, okay, I've learned a lot in my life, and I'm going to write a book. And I am very out there. I'm pretty much what you see is what you get. There's no, no uh, <laughs> errors about me. What, you know? So my book is very uh, adaptable. It's very readable. It's, uh, you can relate to it. I went to coaching school at the same time I was writing a book, at the same time I was raising three teenagers, at the same time I was pulling my hair out. But I figured I wanted to do this. I felt like I was in in this life for a reason, it wasn't for gloom and doom. It was for giving hope to other people. My whole coaching practice is really twofold. It is helping women, men, who have been a, a really hurt in the past and can't get over it, and doing that with humor, doing it with love, doing it with compassion, but also you got to change. you got to change your perspective. you got to look at things a different way. So today I'm going to go over a couple of things that are in the book, but they're called my permission slips, that I'm going to give you guys permission to do these things. And you might sit there saying, well, what is she going to, what is, <laughs> what is she going to tell me to do? You get permission to have an ice cream? No. It's permission to do things that are good for your soul, good for your, your healthy mind, good for your body, good for your, um, just your mind just living day to day to give you hope that, wow, things can turn around. I can make these little choices and these little shifts in my perspective and things can turn around. So the first permission I want to give you is to be kind to yourself. You're like, oh God, that's so cliche, like be kind to myself. Like I'll go get an ice cream. I'm going to keep on saying ice cream. I don't know why, <laughs> because I did that the other night. <laughs> but being kind to yourself isn't just you know, getting an outfit when you want to get an outfit. Being kind to yourself is saying things in your mind that are not berating, that are not hurtful to you, that are things that you say to yourself, oh, I'm stupid, oh, I could never do that. How many times do we do that? We want to do something like, no, I could never do that. I'm too old, I'm not smart enough, I don't have enough education, I don't this, I don't that. It's all these things that we tell ourselves 
that really are not kind. And we have one life to live. Boom, one life. It could be taken away tomorrow. It could be taken away in 50 years from now. Who knows? But you have one life to live. And when you go around being not so nice to yourself, it kind of gives you that heaviness or that you're not good enough and I don't feel good about myself. And you know, we've all been through so much stuff in our lives, ups, downs, good, bad. And to embrace that and to accept our faults is a huge thing, accept things that we may not be so great at. And to concentrate on the things that we are good at. I remember when I was in college, I took an accounting class and I had to because I needed some kind of math to graduate. That's not my thing. It is not my thing, not my thing. I took political science and I t uh, loved philosophy, loved English. Math was just not my thing. And I got an 11 on my final, <laughs> right? Not out of 12, out of 100. <laughs> And I remember telling myself, I'm like, oh my God, I'm such a, but I got A's and everything else. It was just that math thing. I just don't have the brain for it. And I remember way back then just beating myself up because I got an 11. Yeah, it was pretty bad. I had to cry to the teacher. I had to you know, do all the things I had to do in order to graduate. But I could focus on that 11 for the rest of my life and say, I'm such a loser. I will never be able to even add. Or I could say, all right, math's not my thing, but I'm gonna focus on those things that I am good at. I'm gonna focus on those things that are positive, that make me feel good, rather than focusing on those things that make me feel less than and like crap and stupid and you know, the list goes on and on and on. So it's a little thing, but how many times during the day, if you can't do something or if you're not doing something exceptional, you berate yourself. So I'm going to permission, I'm going to give you permission to stop that. As of today, you're going to stop. Or at least be aware of what you're saying to yourself. Be aware of the things that you tell yourself. All right? That's your first permission. Second permission, because there is only one life, we have fear that, that keep us from doing things that we want to do. So I'm going to give you permission to go out of your comfort zone. Ooh, that's scary. Some people do the same thing every day. You get up, you brush your teeth, you comb your hair, you take a shower, or maybe not in that order, and you get dressed, and then you do the same mundane things every single day. Every single day. There is a part of you that said, you know what, I really want to take a cooking class. But, oh, I have to drive into New Bedford or Fall River or Taunton or wherever it is, and I don't want to do that. I mean, okay, so you don't take the cooking class. But you could very easily ask one of your children, you could ask a neighbor, you can ask a friend, do you wanna go with me? And if they wanna drive, that's fine. But you hold yourself back. I don't know, I won't know the people there. They're gonna look at me funny because I don't know how to make a marinara or I don't make a good meatball. Well, that's why you go to a class. Um, I'm sure some of you out there have always secretly wanted to hula dance. <laughs> Or to, uh, <laughs> see, I knew it, right? <laughs> there you go. But have you taken a hula dancing class? I will not. You will not, <laughs> see? But it's something you've always wanted to do, but you put off because of one of a million excuses. The thing is, when you do that, it narrows your life. You know, there's one thing when you have uh, physical issues or things that you absolutely cannot do something, that's one thing. But when it's something that your own fear or your own embarrassment keeps you from doing, then that's another thing. So I'm giving you permission to go out of your comfort zone and do something that you kind of always wanted to do, but you've never done it because you don't know anybody who, who will help you or you don't know a person, like one thing I want to do, and I've been thinking about it a lot, is I want to take up the harp or the violin. Sounds so crazy. I've been wanting to do that since I was like a little kid. And I've been thinking about it and thinking about it. I'm like, Gail, yeah, why aren't you just taking a violin lesson? I'm like, well, okay, so these are the things I tell myself. Well, I don't know where to go for a violin lesson. Well, gee, have I looked online? Have I called anyone? Have I researched it at all? No. So of course I'm not gonna do it because I don't put in the effort to do it. 
So I bet if I went home tonight and Googled, where can I go for beginner's violin lessons, I'm sure there's places I could go. It may be a little far, it may be, you know, maybe not right here, but it's something that is attainable. So I need to give my permission, myself permission to do those things that will take me out of my comfort zone. All right? So some of you in here may have wanted to write a book. All right? I hear this all the time. So I just had my seventh client, uh, coaching client, finish their book. And it's amazing because the fear and the the angst and the uncomfortableness of writing a book is huge, but so many people want to do it. They want to do it. They have something to, to say. You know, people going through, and I, I have coached literally, I've, I've taught this in schools, and there was one class that I had in Worcester. I just like, well, I'm gonna do a three hour class on I wanna write a book. There was 82 people in that class that came. They were standing up in the back. So that just shows me all these people that want to write a book. Some of us have written a book and it's, it's a process. It's, you know, you get scared. It's out of your comfort zone. But those people just were talking to me about their fears. Who's gonna read it? Who's gonna, you know, what if I make a, a spelling error? What if I don't use the tense correctly? What if it's boring? What if somebody doesn't like it? You know, all those fears are, they're out there, but the thing is you have that motive to write. It's out of your comfort zone, but you have that motive to write. And your motive and bottom line is either to entertain, to help someone, to educate them, to inspire them, whatever it is. So you have to go with that motive. And even though all this other stuff is uncomfortable because you've never done it before, the end product is worth it because it could help somebody in the, in the, in the end result. So just think about something that you've been wanting to do that is out of your comfort zone. And I know the belly dancing classes is number one on most of your list, so please. <laughs> Doesn't matter. I even see belly dancers, and it's like we, we went to um, Hawaii recently, and I always thought belly dancers were like stick thin and, you know, but no, they had a little, you know, a little gut and a little, you know, so I'm like... <laughs> I mean, they could really move, but they, they. all right. Permission to um, open your mind up. Here's the next one. Open your mind up to different ways of doing things. Oh, this is a big one. How often are we stuck in the mindset that there is one way to load the dishwasher and that's it. And the way everybody else does it is wrong. And we have to point out that what they're doing is wrong. My husband, oh my God, he drives me crazy. <laughs> you got to put the forks down. I like to put the forks up. So I know when I'm picking it out, I know what, like I'll get stabbed or not or <laughs> whatever. You know, the bowls have to go a certain way. I put them in one way, I open it up, he has it in the other way. The end result is that you pick the bowl up and you pick the fork up, they're both clean once you run the dishwasher. I have this wonderful example of my, my stepmother who, I, who has been in my life since I was 12. She would teach me a lot of things, uh, doing laundry, ironing, things like that. And I, I told this to Joyce the other night. She saw me ironing once. And the way I iron is I do the back first because it's the biggest and the smoothest surface. And then I go to the sleeves and then go turn the, you know, the buttons are the hardest, so I do the side without the buttons, and then the buttons, and then the collar. Put it on a hanger, hang it up. She does the one with the buttons, the sleeves, the front, the collar, and then the back is last. She hangs it up. They're exactly the same, exactly. But she's like, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> And how many of us do that with other people? You know, my way is the right way. No, as long as the outcome is the same and as long as the outcome is what you want, there is no right or wrong way. So I know that this is an issue for some people that they can't get past and they get very frustrated when somebody doesn't do things their way. So I'm just giving you permission. Just be open to other people's way of doing things. It's not hurting anybody that I'm ironing a different way. 
it's not wrong because they both look the same. So in, before you speak to someone or say that you're doing it wrong, just take a little step, step back, take a little breath, and just say, oh, I'm learning something here. They're doing it different. Maybe I could try it that way to open up a little bit. Ooh, see, it's quiet because I know there's some of you out there that do that. Um, OK, permission to set boundaries. This is a big one. This is a big one. I've had so many coaching clients that are in relationship, mostly women, who are in relationships that don't want to say no. They don't want to set a boundary because we're people please we can be people pleasers. That's really tough to say. And we don't want to disappoint anyone. We don't want to hurt anyone. But what happens when we don't say no? Will you will you be a fundraiser for the PTA? Yes. Will you take your daughter, you know, make your make the lunches? Yes. Will you do the laundry? Yes. Will you work full time? Yes. Will you vacuum? Will you this? Will you that? Will you that? All these things we say yes, 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 yes. And what does that do? That burns us out. That makes us feel like we want to kill somebody around us. I know when I have a lot on my plate, it's just like, oh my God, I'm so overwhelmed, I can't stand it. When my daughter was little and after I got divorced, the PTA would always ask me, Gail, will you make cookies? Will you make brownies? Will you? And I did it for years, for years, because I felt that obligation. But there were people around me that like said, no, I can't do it. You know, I just can't do it. And I'm like, how do they even do that? Like, you know, they're not, they're not um, one with the community. They're not helping out. They're not, but they probably had a lot on their plate. And I would get resentful and I would get angry because they were saying no. And I was always like, oh my God, I have to say yes. I didn't want to do it every year. I didn't want to be the point person, but I was always the yes. Until one day where I just had, I was so overwhelmed and someone asked me, can you make brownies for the thing? And I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> you know, I was scared. I was scared to say no. I was, it's the people pleaser, it's the being a good person, blah, blah, blah. But it was harming me, all the things that I had to do. And I thought they would throw eggs at me. I thought, you know, they would kick me or, <laughs> you know, because I didn't make brownies for this, this function. And guess what? They said, oh, okay, I'll go ask so-and-so. And that was, I'm like, seriously, all these years that I said yes, 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 yes to everything. And I didn't get punched in the face. I didn't, you know, get hurt. I didn't, I just said, no, I can't handle it right now. And you can come back to me another time or whatever. So that taught me a big lesson in boundaries that, you know, and not all the time are people going to be that, that cordial or that nice when you say no, but they will um, respect what you have to say. They may get upset, but at least you're taking care of yourself. You're taking care of yourself. And that is the biggest thing because we get burned out. We do so much and it is not good for us. So saying no, um, one of my, one of my closest girlfriends had to say no to a babysitting thing because she works all, all day. And uh, she had to say no to her daughter for a babysitting thing. And it was really hard for her. And she felt really, really guilty. But it was just a lot. It's just a lot. So she said no. And then her daughter found some place else for safe and, and loving for her daughter to go. So it's OK to set boundaries. It really is. All right. We're all quiet now. I see some serious faces. I'm hitting a nerve. All right, here's a tough one. You ready? Hold on, to your, hold on to your seats. I want to give you permission to forgive and to let something go. If you remember an incident from June 3rd, 1972 at 3.15 p.m. and somebody said something to you that made you upset, and when you think about it, you get all angry again. Like, I can't believe that person said that to me or did that. I can't believe it. This was in 1972. So we're talking, what, 72, 82, 92, like 40, 50 years ago? OK. But you still remember the whole thing. And as you're thinking about it, your, your, your fists clench, your face gets red, your veins start popping out of your head, your heart starts racing. 
all these things start happening to your body. Ugh, I'm so upset. I'm so upset. Meanwhile, Mr. Jones, who did whatever it is that hurt you, is on the other side of town eating a salami sandwich, watching Wheel of Fortune, not giving you an ounce of thought. And you're all like, oh my God, oh my God, and it takes you a while to come down from it. So what does that say? That says forgiving someone will benefit you, not the other person. When you hold on to that stuff, it doesn't impact them. They don't know you're not forgiven. They don't know right now that I'm thinking something that happened in 1972. They don't care because they don't know, and it doesn't impact them. So it's still hurting me. Whatever they did, I am allowing it to still hurt me. Now, forgiveness does not mean to like go be best friends and, and you know, get, get hurt all over again. Forgiveness means just letting it go. Writing it down, burn it, put it in, uh, you know, I, I have a chapter in the book called The God Box, but you can call it whatever you want. And just, it's, it's a place for all hurts, all pain, all uh, anger, any kind of revenge thoughts or envy or whatever it is, any negative thoughts, write down, put it in the God box. The God box could be a, a give it away box or let it go box, whatever it is, whatever you choose. But it's that symbolism of writing something down, putting it in the box and say, I'm done with it. I'm done because it's hurting me more than it's hurting anybody else. It is hurting me. And I have got to let go of this anger, this rage, this resentment, because it's not doing any good for my, my health. When your heart starts going and your blood pressure rises, how is that doing? How is that hurting that person that's eating that sandwich across town? It's not, it's hurting you. So you will continue to allow it to hurt. It's a big one. It's a big one because you're like, well, they did that to me. And if I forgive, I'm letting them off the hook. No, you're not letting them off the hook. You are just saying, I'm going to take care of myself and I'm not going to let this take up any more rent in my head, free rent in my head. I had a uh, female client who was probably in her 40s and she had had a lot of pain in her life. And she was talking to me about her brother and she loved her brother. And she hadn't talked to her brother for 17 years. I was like, wow, that's a long time. And she cried about it. She's like, I, I just, you know, she goes, I, I know he did something to hurt me. And I'm like, well, what was that? And she goes, I, I can't remember. And I'm like, you haven't talked to him for 17 years and you don't even know why you're not talking? And she goes, well, I know it was something that hurt me. And she was crying, she had tears and she's like, I'd love to contact him. And I'm like, then contact him. Send him a little email, send him a little note in the mail. Just say, I'm thinking of you. I can't, because he, uh, he must have done something to hurt me really bad if I haven't talked to him that long. I'm like, you don't even know what it was. It's 17 years ago, he could have changed. He's your only living family member. And you're obviously upset about it because when you talk about it, you cry. There's pain there, so heal that pain. So she wrote him a little card, just very, you know, not this big long thing, just a little thing, thinking of you. Probably the day he got it, which was probably two or three days later, she gets a phone call. And it was him. I'm so happy to hear from you. Oh my God. And they cried on the phone. Neither one of them could remember why they parted ways. And they're in, still in touch. And it's a beautiful thing. Sometimes somebody's got to give a little bit. We're all so st stuck in that, well, I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. Do you want to live with that angst or do you want to live with peace? And you know, sometimes the other person won't respond that way. And you know what? That's on them. If you do everything you possibly can do, then you can be at peace with knowing. You reached out, they weren't ready yet. Who knows in the future they might be ready, but then you can at least live with peace that, okay, you made the effort. There's really nothing you can do. You have to accept what you can't change and then just go on with your life in peace. But forgiveness is huge. Forgiveness is, it blocks us a lot of times because when we don't forgive, we hold on. And you know, I am a true believer that anything that we hold on to manifests itself um, in our emotions as well as physically. 
Like I know when I hold on to something and I get really, really upset, it hits my gut. My, my stomach gets all out, of, all out of whack. And it just, you know, some people may get migraines, some people may get back aches. So when you hold on to that stuff, I really, really believe that it is in correlation with your physical, physical being. So get a God box, get a, get a nature box, get a let it go box. And sometimes you can make it a really pretty box by putting baubles on it and little gems and things that you like, if you like flowers, to get a little Kleenex tissue box and you know, put wrapping paper around it with little flowers or get a Chinese box or get something really nice or buy something at a store and write down. I have to let go of this, that, the other thing, put it in the box and say, okay, I'm gonna let the universe handle it or I'm gonna just let God handle it. I'm gonna trust that everything will be okay. All right, so give yourself permission to let go. Woo, all right, where are we with time? Okay, good. Okay, appreciate, <laughs> appreciate the small things in life. I always thought that in order to make a change in life, in order to make a difference in someone's life, I had to build an orphanage. <laughs> I had to do something grand that would take $10 million and that would affect loads and loads of people. And I don't know, I, I always had this grand thing that in order to be impactful, when you're doing something for somebody else or when you're trying to help, it, the bigger the better. And the only thing that would ever make any difference is something grand that took a lot of money, a lot of people. I have learned that a little gentle, kind word to someone, an encouragement, a, I mean, you've heard this all, you know, especially in these times, it's like nuts out there. And just being aware of someone that is hurt, someone that is hurting, someone that needs help, to be able to just reach out to them. So with this whole thing with the computers and the phones, everybody's like this now. And it's not you know, an outreach as much as it used to be. The thing that I learned doing Meals on Wheels, and this is interesting because I deliver Meals on Wheels here on Wednesdays. And the thing that I learned, it was probably about 10 years ago when I did it in the Worcester area. I uh, delivered the meals once a week, and to me, it was no big deal. It really, you know, I'm like, I got out of work for <laughs> an hour every week, got to see some nice elderly people, and it was awesome, and have built little relationships, but I didn't think it was a big deal. I honestly, and people were like, oh, that's so great, that's so great. I'm like, really, it's not a big deal. It's like bringing a meal, putting it to their house, saying hello, how are you, and that was it. Until one day. And it was Margie, and she was 80, she was like 87, and she had just had a stroke. She lived with her son, but her son worked a lot. And there was a big snowstorm, and I got stuck in traffic, I got stuck in the storm, so I was about 45 minutes late um, than my normal time. I usually get there at noon, I got there about quarter of one. When I came in the house, and this was a one person that I could actually go in the house, when I went into the house, I saw her in the garbage rummaging through an empty loaf of bread, and there were some crumbs on the bottom of the, of the, the bag in her garbage. And I'm like, Margie, I'm so sorry I'm late. I, I felt awful. And I said, sit down. Now, seeing that she had a stroke, I had to undo the carton for her, and I had to set everything up. And... She said to me, she was like crying when she sat down. I said, do you want a banana? Do you want something until I get your meal ready? Yes, 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 please, yes, please. She gobbled down the banana two seconds flat. I mean, the poor woman, who knows how long it had been since her last meal. And I gave her all her thing, and I sat down with her, and she goes, how, how would I have eaten if you didn't come around? And she had tears in her eyes, and I thought about it, and I'm like, oh, my God. Peeling a banana to me, <clears throat> to me was nothing. I mean, just peeling a banana, nothing. But to her, that was all the difference in the world. That meant her being hungry or not being hungry. And to me, that little banana thing just changed my whole world. That that simple, tiny task of peeling a banana just changed everything for her in that moment. 
So it made me realize that those little things mean so much. So if you take the effort to give yourself permission to go out of your way just a little bit for somebody, just a little bit, a pat on the bat, well, maybe not touching somebody, but, but just something. Are you okay? Can I do something to help you? Something. It can be to a total stranger. You know, I, I, you know, you see homeless around in big cities and things like that, and I personally don't like to give money out, actual dollars. But you know what? Who wouldn't want a, a nice sandwich and a cup of coffee? So in my car, I keep $2 and $5 Dunkin' Donuts or McDonald's cards, gift certificates, so I can give one instead of giving them cash because I think they're going to go get drugs or alcohol, give them that so they can have a cup of coffee and a hot meal. You know, again, it's, it's McDonald's. It may not be the nicest thing in the world, but just have them in your car. Just have a couple of them in your car when you see somebody in need, and it'll make you feel so much better. It's a little thing to you, five bucks, two dollars, but to them, it's, it's their food for the day. Really, that's a, 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 an awareness perspective, you know, to be aware of your surroundings and aware of needs that people have. You know, if you have a neighbor who's been sick, if they have COVID, you know, and you're going to CVS, just give them a call, stop over and say, hey, I'm going to CVS. Would you want me to pick you up some medicine, tissues, milk, wh whatever it is? Just these little things to go out of yourself a little bit, to think, well, that's a little thing, but that might really help them out a lot. All right. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm winding down here. <laughs> I'm going to give you permission to ask for help. Ooh, some of us hate to ask for help. Some of us don't want to bother anybody. Some of us just think, well, I can do it all myself and I don't need any help. My father and my stepmother uh, both had cancer at the same time. And I lived about an hour away from them. So I kept on asking, I'm like, what can I do for you guys? My father was going through radiation. My stepmother was going through chemotherapy. They were in their 70s at the time. And my father had since passed. And I said to them, I said, can I get you some meals? You know how they have delivery meals or frozen meals? And no, oh, no, no, honey, no, no, it's too much money, and no, no, no. And I'm like, well, well, how are you guys eating? You're coming home, you're throwing up, you're exhausted, and, and my stepmother was cooking all the time, and I'm like, can I please do something? No, 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 honey, no, no, no. It was so frustrating to me because I love them. I wanted to show them that I care, and I wanted to alleviate some stress. So I'm like, you know what? forget it. I'm not listening to them. I'm going to get them meal. So I got them like a 20 pack meal thing to last them however many weeks, days, whatever. And <laughs> my father called once they got it and they had, he's like, gee, that meatloaf was really good. <laughs> gee, I love that spaghetti and meatballs. And, and they loved it. And they were so grateful because they didn't have to cook. They didn't have to worry about it. They could just take it out of the thing, throw it in the microwave. It was done. But it was pulling teeth to get them to say yes, and they never did. I just did it, but I knew they appreciated it once I did it. And that's, you know, if he only said, I need some help, then that would be okay. But sometimes we have to, to push. Oh, but if your child or a friend wants to help you, and it's pride that's standing in your way, but you really do need the help, just say, I, I appreciate it, I really love you. Because if you saw one of your friends in need or one of your family members in need, your child, let's say, your spouse, your very good friend, and you want to show them love and they keep on saying, no, 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 no. It's frustrating to you because you can do something to alleviate some of their distress, some of their pain. So flip it around. If somebody wants to do that for you, then graciously say, yes, I accept. And thank you, honey. Thank you, friend. Thank you, loved one. I really appreciate it. You know? We get very, very stuck, and we get very stubborn. So permission to unstubborn yourself and get some help. <laughs> um, last one. I want you to do, would you guys mind doing a little kind of meditation exercise? Would anybody mind that? Okay. It's, I'm not going to make you 
you know, go through hoops or anything. All I'm going to ask you to do is just shut your eyes for a minute. Shut your eyes. And I want you to appreciate everything you've been through. We all have a different path in life. We all have a different journey. And I want you to appreciate the things that you have been through, the, the struggles that you have had and how you've overcome them. I want you to just take a minute and just breathe, breathe through everything you've been through and say, wow, I'm really proud of myself. I've been through ups, I've been through downs, I've been through wonderful times, I've been through awful times. And I am sitting here today and I am strong and I am courageous and I made it through. So I want to do a little meditation. Keep your eyes closed also. I want to do a little, little meditation to just kind of, this is something you can use before you go to bed if you feel uptight or anxious. I want you to picture a cork on the top of your head with a hole. And I want you to picture two corks at the bottom of your feet. And I want you to undo both corks. The one on your head is in, a little bit larger than the ones on the bottom of your feet, but right now when you take the corks off, you have a hole in the top of your head and you have two holes um, at the bottom, one on each foot. And I want you to picture a golden bubble. And the golden bubble is going on, on the top of your head in the hole. And it is warm, it's bright, it's, it's orange. And it's this wonderful bubble that is just starting to slowly seep down your forehead, your cheeks, your nose. And it's this wonderful warmth. It's like a, a, a light of happiness, of peace, of contentment. And it's going down, down your face slowly. Picture it like syrup or something just slowly going down, down your face, down your neck. This bubble represents happiness, it represents love, it represents freedom, peace, and it feels really, really good. The golden bubble, it's going down your shoulders, down your neck, down your chest, and it just feels really, really wonderful and safe. And at the bottom of your feet, you're starting to release some negative things. Any resentments that you have, any pains that you have, any hurt that you have, you're gonna release it at the bottom of your feet as the golden bubble flows down your body. And it feels really good to release that stuff. And the stuff coming out of your feet might look like a gray cloud, it might look like tar, it might look like um, just a puff of smoke with a little bit of color. And as your golden bubble goes down further in your body, you're feeling a little bit more relaxed. Your shoulders are starting to relax. Your stomach is relaxing. Your chest is relaxing. Take a deep breath and just relax. And the golden bubble is, is going over pains and hurts that you have had, but it's telling you that things are gonna be okay, that everything is gonna be okay. You've made it this far, you've learned so much, and I'm really proud of you. And you're telling yourself, I'm so proud of you. You did it, you're strong. And the golden bubble is down by your hips now, down your thighs, and the smoke and the, the release down your feet is getting darker because you're filling your whole body up with it and you're, you're digging deep now and releasing a little bit darker material. Maybe stuff from childhood, it may be stuff from a relationship, maybe someone that hurt you, but you're letting it go because you're replacing it with love and light and energy from the golden bubble. And your golden bubble is going down your legs to your ankles, 
until there's that last bit of substance of matter <laughs> that's coming from your, your feet. And this stuff may look like tar. This may be the deep, deep stuff that you just have wanted to let go your whole life. And now you're just letting it go and filling it with love and peace and goodness and hope and compassion and empathy for yourself, for others. So I want you to release the last bit of smoke, whatever it is, from the bottom of your feet. And I want you to plug back up your feet and plug back up your head with the cork and visualize it. So now your whole body is lighter. It feels really good for this moment to let go of all that stuff that's been in you and just to feel your body so much lighter, happier, full of hope, full of peace. And just sit with it for a minute. And when you're, when you're ready, you can come back to the room and tell me how wonderful you feel. <laughs> how was that? Feels a little different than when you first came in, huh? Yeah. So that is my, my spiel for today. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I'll be here signing your books if you, if you want. Everybody, um, the, I'll, I'll sign your book. It, the books are $10 each. Um, if you want to get them online, uh, I have um, some cards here that, on Kindle, something like that. If you want to, I, I can give you one of the cards. But any questions? Anybody have any comments or questions? Yeah, Devani? Oh, yes, hi. Do you have any business cards to contact you for? Um uh, coaching. Yes. Yep. I have everything on my website and I can give you all that information. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Is it challenging to get a book self-published? No. It's challenging to write the book. It's challenging to market the book. To publish it? No. <laughs> there's just a lot of moving pieces to a book. There's, you know, there's, you have the content of the whole book and then you have the cover, the back, the little blurbs, you know, things like that. Once you get your book together, self-publishing it really is not a big deal. What is more difficult is to market it. Once you force all your family and friends to buy the book, <laughs> that's when it gets to be, and that's, you know, you got to get out there, out of your comfort zone. Doing this for me today, I've done it probably 500 times, but doing this for me today, the first couple of times I did it, so out of my comfort zone. I was like, you know, oh my God, they're going to hate it. They're going to, you know, and then over time you do it like anything else. If you do it a couple of times, then you get more comfortable and, you know, it's just, it's just what you do just to be able to get the message out to I do this just because I know where I was, and if it can help somebody just a little bit, then it's, it's worth it to me. It really is. So any other questions or anything? Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. And my, hey, look at that. I did good time. <laughs> well, thank you very much for Oh, coming. thank you, Devaney. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Oh.